right. If you would, take out your Bibles and <laughs> turn to the book of Numbers. We'll be in chapter 21 today. This will be uh, week three of the Pursuing the Promise series, and this is an interesting passage, and I think it's one that's somewhat well known, but we also at the same time don't uh, look at this passage very often, so, um, but it's an interesting uh, story with, with the country of Israel and their continued journey with God. Um, so just, if you haven't been here in the past couple of weeks, we've had, um, we went through the Passover on the first week. We talked about how God um, delivered judgment through plagues on Egypt who had Israel enslaved for 400 years, terrible slavery, and how God freed them from that slavery, and how um, the Israelites put the blood on their doorpost so that when the Passover came, it did not harm any people of Israel, and how all of that pointed directly towards Jesus and what he does for us by shedding his blood for those that love him. And so um, last week we talked about the Red Sea and how um, it was just such an incredible picture last week in that passage with if you weren't here, that we, we just talked about how you're just standing right there at the, at the shoreline facing this massive sea in front of you, and there's an Egyptian army coming up behind you, and we had talked about how there was, they're thinking there's just no hope for us now. There's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. We're out here, the sea, and an army behind us coming up. But then God provided the way, the way of salvation. And the powerful thing about that image is there are, there are two paths. And I don't want to re-preach the whole thing, but there are just the two paths. There was the path that looks back, that's looking back on Egypt and, and how they, they were at least, it wasn't great, but they were comfortable. They had a place to stay. They had food. They had all of those things. There's the, there's the path that looks back, the path that's leading to destruction, and then the path ahead. When, when God parted the sea, the path ahead that leads to salvation. And I think it's fair to say that they were tempted to go back. They were tempted to surrender and just say, let's just go back there. We'll, they may come and just wipe us all out right here on the shoreline, but maybe we'll just get to go back and have some kind of normalcy. I think there was temptation and desire to go back to that. But I think we often do the same thing where we are standing there at the shore and the way is right in front of us, but we get caught up looking back looking back at our past, looking back at our struggles. And we get caught in this position where we're not really moving forward, but we're always continuing to look back. And so we discussed that this week, and, and the goal, uh, sorry, last week, and the goal is, was to keep your eyes focused and fixed on Jesus. And we're going to look more, about, more on that today, fixing your eyes on Christ I will say that this, this week at camp, um, one of the trials that we faced at camp that Cade didn't really share about is the state of the cabin that we stayed in. And, you know, our lives can be messy sometimes, but God can come and clean it up. It was, it was, um, it was a disaster in there. Um, it was all great. It was great. It was, I was only able to go Wednesday and Thursday um, for the week, and I left Friday morning uh, just before they left and came back home. It was a great week. Um, I want to echo what um, 
Kate and maybe Emily said, or maybe Jennifer. But, you know, a lot of times we think of camp as something for the students. But I think that adults desperately need time away just as much, if not more, than the students do. We need time away to escape and get away, get away from phones, get away from distractions, and draw away with the Lord. And I, the reason I say we might need it more is because the students are looking at who a lot of the time? Us. And so maybe that's something we need to think about as we move forward is just making sure that we are getting away. Maybe as a church, getting away, um, doing some kind of retreat or something. But it's necessary for our soul to reunite and reconnect with the Lord without distraction. So in this passage today, we're Numbers 21. I'm going to read some of it, and then we'll kind of stop and, and then continue on in a bit. Um, I will say before I get there, though, um, before we read, there's been a lot of time that's passed since last week. Last week we were in Exodus 14, and the Red Sea parted. Brother Stephen said, he read out of how they were so grateful, and they sang a song of praise on their deliverance. And they were so thrilled to be set free. They watched their, they, they watched their enemies be washed away, and they're, they're rejoicing and celebrating. Time has passed. The Lord has given them the commandments so that they may live in harmony with him as well as live in harmony with each other. He's provided bread from heaven, which we'll look at today. When they were hungry, he brought bread down from heaven. And then Israel sends out 12 spies to the land that, that's promised to them. They send out 12 spies. And of the 12... Ten of them came back, and you know what they said? No way. We cannot go over there. They're going to destroy us. I saw some of those guys over there in that land, and they're just going to wipe us out. We can't do this. Even though God said, this is yours. Trust. We just had the Red Sea. You just saw what God did through the plagues. And then when they see the land that they're promised, again, they have a lack of faith because they fear what's in the land. And so what happens is they say, okay, we're not going to listen to the two that says, let's do it, let's go. We're going to listen to the 10 and we're just going to not go in. And because of that decision and their disobedience to God, they're stuck, and they're, they're stuck wandering in the desert for 40 years. And we kind of come into that picture here today as they're just stuck. And so in Numbers 21, I'll start reading in verse 4. It says, From Mount Or, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, And the people became impatient on the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. Okay, and we'll pause there. So the people became impatient. I believe this is understandable. It's estimated that there were possibly over 2 million people of Israel right here. That's a lot of people. Over 2 million people with livestock, livestock with their possessions, but without really a home. Now, if you were to think of yourself in that situation, do you find you, do you think that you would find yourself getting impatient with other people? Getting impatient because you don't have a place to just stay and call home? 
So I would think there's probably going to be tension and struggle. And that's what they're experiencing. And so they start complaining against God and against Moses. And they start to think back to their time in Egypt, just like they did whenever they approached the Red Sea. They said, why did you just bring us out here? Did you just want us to get us out of Egypt so that we would die out here? And again, they're saying those same words here. And then the passage says something that's kind of funny and interesting. I typically read out of the English Standard Version, but it, it said, in quotes, for there is no food or water. Okay, no food, no water. And the very le- next line, it says that they said, we loathe this worthless food. So you just said there's no food and no water, but we hate this food that we're eating. And we talked briefly at the end of last week about this bread that they were given, this bread that was given from heaven. And and we'll see more about that today, but it would, it would fall down, and, it, and Scripture said it was like dew on the ground. Like, just, I don't even, I can't even imagine what that would be like. There's just bread all, all across the ground, and they were commissioned. God told them, you're going to go out, and every day you're going to get your daily portion of bread. Give us our daily bread. And so they would go out, and they would gather their, their daily portion But now this food is just worthless to them. They hate this bread. And they're starting to groan and complain against Moses and God. See, when we misplace our attention, when we direct our hearts and minds away from being grateful and thankful for what is provided, we become irritated. We, We complain. We... Look at the negative side of things. In John chapter 6, in the New Testament, it says, Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, But my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus says to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. It's clear that this picture in the Old Testament was representing Jesus. Jesus is the bread of life. But so much of the time, we, like I said, we take our eyes off of him and we become bitter. We start to complain about things. We complain about anything and everything. And we look for satisfaction and joy all around us. Money, possession, purpose, our work. We look for satisfaction in relationships. And when those things don't satisfy us, we get upset that I didn't get what I wanted. This is not what I wanted. This is not how I wanted it. Are we as Christians really going to be a people that complains Or are we going to be a people that lives their life in gratitude and thankfulness? Over and over in the Old Testament, we see the Israelites, they wander from God. And they even get caught up worshiping the other gods of the cultures around them. They get swept away by false teachings and and they wander away from God. And then God 
over and over, he brings correction. God brings judgment to them in pretty significant ways. And this passage that we just read, he does the same. He brings judgment and correction to his people. I don't know about you, but to me it looks like the very same thing is happening in the American church. Where for years Christians have become basically indistinguishable from anybody else. And I personally think that there may be difficult days ahead of us. Days where we are no longer able to blend in. Because we're going to start, if we're really going to stick with Christ, then we're going to start sticking out more and more like a sore thumb. We might even find ourselves cast out and rejected from friends, from family, because we're not willing to go along with the ways of the world. At that point, I do think that is God's correction on his church. And I think it is what will strengthen the church. We'll continue on in verse 7. It says, The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people And the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, he shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. So this is a really interesting solution. It's a really bizarre thing in Scripture that God would kind of give this instruction to Moses. First off, we see the people, they come to Moses, they realize we've made a mistake, we've sinned against God, and we need some deliverance from this struggle right here that we're in. And they said, Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. Did God take away the serpents? He did not take them away. It's interesting that God doesn't take away the serpents, but instead he heals the people in spite of the bites. The last couple weeks we've been talking about punishment and how the punishment was on Egypt. Egypt because they were oppressing people because of the slavery, because they were uh, attempting to go and and bring bring the Israelites back into Egypt and all the things. And so God exercises judgment on Egypt. But this time, the judgment is on Israel. Because of their disobedience, because they are growing. And if you have If you have kids, you probably know how this goes. As they're little, you kind of start to get on to them, so they start to learn. And as they grow up, they become more knowledgeable, and so you probably get on to them a little harder. And for me, the... the, um, their leash gets shorter and shorter the older they get because they should know better. And that's where the people of Israel are now. They've been walking for years in the wilderness, this journey where they kind of move back and forth and God's correcting them. And even further on in the, in the Old Testament, they get severe correction by Uh, being taken captive and putting back into slavery later on in the Old Testament. But this is a passage where he's still in the beginning stages, I feel like, of disciplining his people. And so he tells, as these snakes are, 
as these serpents are, are biting them, and the people are dying, God didn't just remove the snakes, but he healed them despite the venomous bites. And the snakes not only carried out the judgment of God, but it was the image of the snake that healed the people from the very bite of the snakes. So I, I don't know about you, but I feel like most of us have probably seen the little, I don't even know if you guys can see the, the little image up there with the staff with the snake wrapped around it. Where do you see that? Hospitals? It's a symbol of healing. And the interesting thing about this passage is, is in John chapter 3, just before John 3, 16, and John 3, 14 and 15, it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. It's a passage that points to the coming Jesus. That judgment is coming to all of us. We've all been disobedient. We've all sinned and made mistakes in our life. And the sting of sin hinders our lives. It impacts our lives. It impacts the lives of those around us. But when we look to the cross... That is where our healing is found. That is where our forgiveness is found. Jesus was the one that was going to bring, is going to bring judgment, but he was also the one that endured the punishment that we deserved. When we look to Jesus, when we surrender our lives and trust him, we are forgiven. The message here is to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. To keep our eyes fixed on the way. And to keep our eyes fixed on the promise. You know, as we, as the students are leaving camp, something that is always a struggle is leaving that experience and coming back to the real world. And to me, I think it, it's similar to Moses' experience of being drawn away and on the mountaintop. Being in the presence of God and having to come down to these people that are just complaining and fighting and bickering over everything. And that's very similar to what you guys that were just at camp are going to experience. You had this great time away with the Lord where you're able to focus on him. And now you're coming back down the mountain. And the goal is to keep your eyes focused on Jesus. When we, when we, pull, our, when we pull our eyes away from Jesus, that's when the worries, the concerns, and the fears will start to overtake us. And we start to be obedient to the world instead of Christ. And it's the same for all of us. You might wake up one morning, have a Bible study, read the word, pray, and feel, feel great, and then step out the door and the world hits you. And it's in those moments of where you're going to turn your eyes to something. Are you going to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus? Or are they going to be fixed on the struggles, the anxiety, the issues of the world. We've got a lot of things that are going on all around us in our country. A lot of um, turmoil, uh, turmoil and a lot of times we want to point the finger as if it's someone else's fault that we are here in this situation. But I think it's fair to say 
to the church, what have we been doing? Have we clung to Jesus ourself? How do we expect a culture to stay close to Jesus if the church doesn't stay close to Jesus? And so my encouragement today is as as we walk into times where people bring up discussions or complaints, whether they're Christian or non-Christian, my hope is that you would offer hope. That you would offer a perspective of joy and comfort. Because it's so easy. Is it not easy to just jump on board with what is being said and just, yes, I agree, I agree. But instead, what if we are the light in the world? What if we're there to offer up hope? When Moses came down the mountain, there was something that happened to him. Does anybody know whenever he would go up and he would come back down to the Israelites, what what was his appearance like? He was glowing. Moses' face was shining because he was in the presence of God, and that was the glory of God, God shining on him. Is that how we look? Because of our time with God, are we going out and people see the light of God shining from us because of our time with him, because of our hope, because of our joy, and because of the peace that we have because of him? Or do we let the world tarnish all of that? It's imperative in this passage when there's so many things coming around us to try to bite, to try to steal our attention, to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. And so if you're here this morning and you know you haven't been focused on Jesus, Christian, non-Christian, You haven't been focused on Jesus. My encouragement is that you would say, I need him to captivate my heart and my mind this morning. I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not going to continue on and just going along with where the world is trying to lead me, how they want me to live, how they want me to speak. I'm going to be set apart and I'm going to stand my ground. I want to invite you to come up and pray. And say, God, I need to surrender. I need, I need you to captivate all of me so that I can be the light in the world that needs it. So if you need to make a decision this morning to follow Christ, to surrender your heart to Christ and give him your all, I hope that you would do that this morning. If you're a Christian that feels like you're stuck on the shore between the path, the way, and the past, you continue to look, being distracted and looking back or looking at all the circumstances around you coming up upon you, I hope that you would come down today and say, God, help me fix my eyes on the way. Help me fix my eyes on you. Let's pray. God, we are so thankful for your word. We th- we're thankful for God teaching us and instructing us because we can get so carried away with things that are around us, things that distract us and pull our attention constantly from you. And so God, as we are here this morning, I pray that we don't want to step out of this room without saying, God, I want to be used by you. I want to remain close to you. God, and if there's someone here that needs to surrender their life over to you, I pray that they would make that decision this morning, that they would come down and share, I need Jesus in my life. I know my future. I know the path I'm walking down leads to destruction, but I want to walk down the path of salvation. God, let your will be done this morning and in the week ahead, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.